Uh, I understand that Remy uh, yesterday already uh, introduced you to the world of manifolds. Um, uh, it, my theme shares uh, uh, some of uh, the theme that he uh, talked about, mainly uh, the fact that the real world, uh, the structures in the real world and structures in neural, neural circuits that represent the real world uh, are often captured uh, by, by the notion of, of manifolds, or dimension manifolds. But as you'll see, the, aside from that, uh, the rest is quite different, the, the problem is, is different, the, the architecture of networks that uh, we I'll be talking uh, about are, are different. Um, okay, so before I start, let me just introduce the collaborators, uh, or some of the collaborators of, of this work, Dan Lee from Cornell Tech and Samsung AI, Soyun Chang, uh, no, she's now at Columbia University postdoc, and Uri Cohen at Hebrew University, uh, a PhD student, there are others which uh, I may get to them if I have time. Um, <coughs> so um, I, I want to uh, kind of the outline of, of, my, of my talk, again, if I cover everything, is uh, to talk about the notion of <coughs> separating or, or uh, classifying manifolds um, uh, and, uh, and the relation between the ability to classify uh, manifolds and, and the geometry. So important part which I want to elaborate on will be the notion of geometry of manifolds um, and uh, the, the main message I already uh, want to tell you now is that geometry uh, of manifolds, both the definition of manifolds and the geometry, uh, in my view is very much task dependent. So dependent, depending on what you want to do with them, what type of processing, what type of computation uh, you have in mind, uh, uh, this might uh, likely um, define or motivate different definitions of geometry. Um, and the geometry that I'll be talking about is related to uh, linear classification. Um, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss this theory uh, a little bit. Uh, then I'll show how uh, this can be applied to get insight uh, uh, about the working of uh, deep convolutional networks in, in vision. Um, if I, I'll probably skip uh, the neural data uh, application uh, because of lack of time, because I want to talk uh, also a little bit about uh, geometry of generalization, uh, which is somewhat different from uh, the geometry of classification. Okay, so why manifold? So, uh, as you all know, uh, physical uh, 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 objects uh, are uh, categories of objects, uh, identity of persons or faces, uh, uh, and uh, different objects, uh, animals, and so on and so forth. Um, come in uh, a whole variety of uh, uh, physical, uh, physical characteristics. So the same object uh, can be instantiated um, uh, at, the, uh, at the input layer, at the, at the external world, by, uh, by uh, many different stimuli, um, depending on location, orientation, background, uh, scale, distortion, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, part of the challenge of any system that uh, uh, is uh, uh, involved in processing uh, object-related uh, data um, has to uh, overcome, has to deal with this, uh, with this enormous variability. In the context of neuroscience, or in the context of, uh, uh, of um, uh, understanding um, what the brain is doing with, uh, with inputs. Um, uh, there has been a long-standing problem of why very often in the brain uh, sensory systems come uh, in, in multiple stages. They are not really fit forward, but for now we'll talk about fit forward. So uh, uh, the most, uh, uh, most well-known example and well-studied well example is the visual hierarchy where you have uh, the input layer, the pixel layer, so to speak, retina, then there are uh, a, a cascade of stages, uh, mostly in, in uh, visual cortex, uh, 
And then the top layer is what's known as IT, which is considered to be the top, uh, the top layer of, uh, of the visual cortex. From, from there, the, the information goes to uh, downstream systems that already involve uh, uh, multimodal information, not only vision and memory of uh, different types and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, this part is, uh, is uh, the, the uh, cascade of transformations of signals along the, uh, uh, along the hierarchy of visual cortex. This is also only one uh, stream of the visual cortex which has to do with shapes and forms uh, and objects. So, so this is what, uh, what is depicted here. And the basic question is, um, wh wh what is the advantage of uh, reformatting the same signals uh, along these uh, different stages? Uh, there is not uh, something else that coming uh, from other modalities. Uh, everything is just uh, transform uh, transformed from one stage to another, uh, very much like deep convolutional networks uh, in, in a variety of problems. And uh, an obvious answer uh, uh, is, and has been uh, uh, proposed by, by several uh, researchers, is that uh, the, the, the goal of this is not necessarily to bring in information from other sources, which it doesn't really do that, but the goal is to uh, uh, change the representation in such a way that uh, object uh, information uh, is uh, easier to read from the top layer uh, than from the input layer. And, and the, the picture, the uh, the, the cartoon picture is uh, you can see here. This is uh, the state space uh, of the input layer. So each uh, each axis here is uh, one uh, one one pixel activation. Uh, and if you ask, uh, if, if you think about all all possible instantiation of images corresponding to to one person, uh, you you you'll get some manifold, then another person, another manifold, and in in the input layer, these two manifolds are very uh, entangled with each other, so uh, the information about these two ob uh, these two categories are there, but it's uh, it's uh, very hard uh, or impossible almost to uh, uh, to um, uh, to separate them by a plausible uh, a readout, which I'll take to be uh, as a hyperplane. So you cannot linearly separate them at the input layer, uh, but then gradually these uh, manifolds, these two manifolds are are uh, separated nicely, flattened, and so on. And by the time you go to IT cortex, uh, these two manifolds can be nicely separated by hyperplane. So that's the basic idea that uh, we, we think about the, the quality of the representation uh, of uh, a category uh, uh, in a given stage uh, uh, by the ability to decode uh, information about the category uh, by a linear readout. So, so that's uh, uh, that's the concept. If you, you, of course, you can say well by linear, maybe something spiking network, or maybe some quadratic. But definitely, you have to you have to limit the, the readout because if you don't limit the readout, then uh, you can always uh, design a complicated readout at this stage. In fact, the brain is a complicated readout at this stage. So in order to uh, understand the difference, post potential difference between the representation at the top layer and the input layer, and, and similarly for intermediate layers, you have to ask whether the object information or category information uh, is accessible by a simple readout uh, at, at the given stage. That's, that's, a, that's the concept. Okay, so uh, again, similar things you can, uh, you can ask about deep networks, uh, but then I immediately the question is, um, yeah, how do we measure the degree of uh, entanglement? Uh, we can, of course, measure the ability to, to uh, linearly uh, classify, but are they uh, associated geometry or geometric me measures which uh, are related to this, uh, to this uh, issue? Um, and uh, basically, we want to know the top layer. We, we um, if I go back to here, uh, it, it would be in principle possible to think about a, a, an object uh, 
uh, an object a layer of, of the brain as being completely invariant in the sense that uh, this manifold will just collapse to a point. Then we'll say this is simply invariant representation. But that's, that doesn't happen. At least doesn't happen in the, in the sensory system. It may happen downstream. But in the sensory system, even at top layer, you, you do see uh, the responses are uh, sensitive to location, to uh, pose, to rotation, and so on, to, to, to a substantial degree. Uh, so even the top layer does not lose completely information about those physical variables that, that specify the manifold. But somehow they manage to organize them uh, in a way to, uh, to that is, uh, is, um, makes, it, uh, uh, makes it accessible to linear EDA. Okay, um, an underlying agenda for theorists, and particularly for uh, statistical mechanics uh, uh, theory, uh, is the challenge to uh, extend theory, um, statistical mechanical theory, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a level that it can be really applied to real life statistical structures. And that has been a problem for, I think, for us theorists for, for very long, that um, there are beautiful statistical mechanic theories, uh, spin glasses, learning, uh, and, and etc. Even memory. Um, in most of those uh, uh, theories, they are built on very strong simplifying assumptions about the data, Gaussian or binary, uh, random, um, etc., etc. But then, they, of course, those theories are important. They give insights. Some of the insight may be applicable more generally, but you cannot really take the theory as it is and, and, and test it against data, because the data are, are, are much more complicated, much more complex in their structure. And, and the, real, the real challenge here, the, the agenda uh, from a theory perspective uh, is, uh, can we have statistical mechanics uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, a degree that uh, uh, it, c it can be directly uh, tested against uh, real life, um, uh, real life uh, 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 data structures and also uh, complex networks. Okay, so uh, I say manifold, so let me define what, what I mean by manifold because there are many definitions of manifolds and uh, ours is, is quite general. Uh, uh, and so here is just qualitatively the picture again. There is some layer in, uh, it is either in, a, in, in the brain or in, in, a, in a neural network, uh, artificial neural network, uh, some layer that respond to, uh, to, a, a, to a set of stimuli. So each point here is a point in Rn represent the, the activity of a neurons in that layer. Uh, so the embedding dimension is n, n is large, going to be very large. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, each, uh, each physical uh, stimulus, let's say its image, uh, is corresponding to a point, but now a set of uh, stimuli that correspond to the same category or, or object or, or an animal, in this case dog, uh, will, be, uh, will be considered uh, as, as a manifold, and similarly a manifold of cats, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, what do I mean by that? Formally, we assume the following. We assume that a single manifold in Rn is actually low dimensional in the sense that uh, all the points belonging to a manifold uh, lie in d dimension. So the variability, uh, the, the fine subspace is d dimension. Uh, uh, here it's two. Uh, including the center or the distance of the center of the manifold from the origin, uh, which will uh, generate another dimension. So altogether, you can write every point on the manifold as a sum of d plus one uh, coordinates. These are the u's, because we'll, we'll, we'll assume to be orthogonal for, for now. Uh, and uh, the, the coefficients uh, of this uh, uh, along those axes uh, obey this s i mu i is the uh, one of those coordinates going from 1 to d plus 1. Mu is the index of the manifold. Uh, this is, let's say, mu 1, mu 2, and so on. Uh, and for each manifold, then there is a constraint on 
on those, uh, on, the, on those SIMUs, which define the shape of the manifold. So every manifold is defined by a center, by uh, a variability, uh, uh, by a, a, a d-dimensional uh, uh, subspace of variability given by the U's, uh, and then by some shape uh, which is constrained, uh, which, which is some constraint uh, on, on S. For instance, if it is a sphere, then uh, sum of the square of SIs will be uh, R square. If it's ellipsoid, then there will be another constraint, but it can be some whatever, some other constraint. Okay? That's the notion of a manifold. Okay, now uh, what we are going to assume for now is that uh, whatever the structure is, uh, uh, the, the geometric structure of the shape uh, is given here, uh, different manifolds. Uh, will will have the same the same characterization except that uh, the dimensionality the, the, not the dimensionality the uh, the location of these manifolds uh, uh, and the orientation of those subspaces will will be random later on if I have time I'll talk about correlations which we take into account but uh, but for now let's assume they are so. Uh, manifolds in our end, there are many manifolds in our end, uh, P of them, uh, they will be kind of randomly centered and randomly oriented d dimensional uh, structures. Okay. So, um, so now the, what, what we ask uh, is the following question. We ask uh, whether we can separate those manifolds by linear, uh, by linear hyperplane. So here there are two, but in general there are many. And uh, we, we ask whether a linear hyperplane can separate them. So what do I mean by separate them? So I mean a binary classification problem. So the, the most important aspect is that all the points on a manifold has the same label. So for instance, if I label uh, a dog to be plus one, then all the points uh, on, on, on the dog manifold are, have the label plus one. And similarly, here all the points on, on the manifold cat will be, have minus one. But imagine you have many manifolds, p of them, hundred, thousand, or whatever. Um, we give a label to them, so half of them will be plus one, half of them will be minus one, and we'll do uh, we'll ran we'll have random labels of each manifold. So we we are not going to uh, uh, look at a specific. Uh, uh, task which is given a specific labels uh, to this manifold to that manifold, but we're going to randomize uh, the labels on them, uh, and then of course by randomizing the labels, uh, it means that uh, in some cases it will be uh, it might be easier to easier to separate than others. But as you all know, in large N uh, and given statistical mechanics. Uh, results, uh, we know that the, there will be a sharp threshold. So uh, below that threshold, <laughs> the threshold being the, the number, uh, threshold about the number of manifolds, below that threshold with almost pro pro probability one, uh, all, uh, almost all binary labels, uh, labeling will be uh, linearly classified and above the, thresh above the threshold uh, most of them, almost all of them, will not be linearly classified. Okay, and uh, <coughs> so that's one of the results that come out of uh, statistical mechanics, uh, uh, which is that uh, given some mild assumptions about the manifolds, uh, they behave uh, uh, similarly to separating of points. So in, in the sense that uh, the, the maximum number of, separa of separable linearly separable manifolds scales with the number of neurons under the condition that I said. And the ratio of them then is, uh, is, is defined the capacity. So that's already something which is uh, a, a very interesting uh, a, a consequence, a theoretical consequence, which means that uh, if we want to uh, test the capacity of IT cortex to uh, separate uh, uh, manifolds of object, we don't have to record from all neurons in IT cortex. We just have to sub subsample them and some sample objects and compute alpha C, and this will scale. Uh, and similarly for deep convolutional networks. So that's kind of extensivity. And you can think about this parameter alpha C as the, uh, as the uh, uh, information about object identity uh, per neuron. 
So that's that's one way to think about this. Just yeah. a question about the d, mm. the dimension. Should I yeah. think of this as so a I, I, I Here I think about d is fixed, okay. and n and p goes to infinity. n is the embedding dimension, and p is the number of manifolds in this dimension. Yeah, but but d is fixed. Right? If d is if d is itself is extensive, then uh, then there are more severe restrictions on them in order for alpha c to be okay. Okay, so n n let's see if we, we can have some intuition about the problem uh, by thinking about bounds. So one bound can be if the manifolds are just points, so they are very almost almost invariant representation, as I said. Okay, so in that case, it basically uh, the same problem is separating points, and it's well known result that in high dimension alpha c is two, right? So uh, Two endpoints uh, uh, can be linear, up to two endpoints can be linearly separable with random labeling uh, above it now. Uh, now, uh, what happens if, you, if the manifolds are fake manifolds? By that I mean you take just n times p points, right? So we have, let's say the points, so when, we, when I talk about manifolds, the manifold may not necessarily be continuous manifolds like spheres or ellipsoids. Or, or a curve. They can be just point clouds, and we will use a lot the point cloud uh, uh, manifold. So, so imagine I have point clouds. So I have uh, this is one manifold, and this is another manifold. So let's say, uh, okay, so the manifold consists only of, uh, I don't know, four points here and four points here. So, I'll, so I have P of them, so I have all together M times P points, okay? Now I can. Uh, I can ask what happens if I just take m times p point, which just random points, and assign them to manifold in random way. So imagine I have instead I have eight points like this. I just have eight points, uh, and I just say this one and this one and this one belong to one manifold, and this and this belong to another manifold. It's completely shuffled shuffled data. Okay, then of course the problem of separating the manifold in this case will be the same as problem of separating points, except that now there are MP points, right? So then the, the capacity will just be 2 over M, right? Because this is like uh, P over N, and there are MP points are so just 2 over M. So it's the same result as this, right? Okay, so that's one bound, very simple bound. Another bound which can be easily, uh, uh, easily uh, uh, computed, I won't go into it. Uh, but it's kind of related to that. What happens if the manifolds are, are, are continuous, basically are infinitely in size, but are low dimensional? So you just have separating between subspaces. So imagine you have n dimension, you have p uh, <coughs> uh, randomly oriented uh, subspaces, linear subspaces. And now you're asking whether you can separate those subspaces. And, and it's easy to, to derive uh, this, this bound here. Okay, so, so <laughs> the, the, the conclusion of that is that uh, in general, th th we have these bounds. Uh, if, uh, uh, if there is no statistical structure, it's just 2 over m. If there is statistical structure but unbounded in size, it's going to be 2 over d, where d is the dimension of each one of those uh, subspaces. Uh, in both cases, <laughs> in real data, since we expect both d to be large and m to be large, this is bad news, then capacity will be very small. So what we really want is the capacity to be order one. So from the perspective of, of, uh, of separation, we, this is tangled case, this is untangled. Okay? If the representation is such that there is statistical structure of the manifold, uh, <coughs> and it's not just random points, and it's, it's, con it's, it's uh, bounded or sufficiently small in size and so on, then uh, we, we hope to get this. So that question is, what is required to get alpha C of order 1? What, what is needed to, to be the case? OK. So, so here, here there are the, the, some summary of the results. So I already talked about the notion of alpha C. And then the, 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 the theory uh, relates the capacity to uh, manifold radius and dimension. So Rm and Dm, Rm is the radius of the manifold, Dm is the dimension of the manifold. And basically, uh, uh, the theory says that uh, these are the most important uh, quantities. So in the sense that uh, for, for arbitrary shape of the manifold, even for points and so on, the, the capacity will be the same as the capacity of, of spheres, which has a very nice formula, which uh, very nice analytical formula, uh, but with the same radius and dimension. 
And furthermore, the, 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 uh, the theory says that what separates uh, entangled from unentangled, this is what I said here, is uh, there is some nice scaling law. So uh, basically, Rm, the radius times the square root of dimension, has to be uh, either uh, below 1 to get to here, if it is uh, substantially bigger than 1, but basically we are in this region. So there is a nice scaling law relating dimension and a radius to, uh, to separate the, the poor uh, representation from, from the good representation. So this all comes out of, of the theory. Let me just tell you a little bit more about what, so, uh, so I want to go back to here. So this, is, this looks like trivial. I'm saying think about all manifold and approximate them as spheres. That's, that's true except for the fact that the, the definition of radius and dimension is subtle. So it is once you once you establish the radius and dimension of the manifolds, then you can think about them as equivalent balls. But the the, the definition of radius and dimension is uh, is uh, is really incorporating aspect of the shape of the manifolds. Can I ask a maybe naive question? But this seems to be dimensionally strange. This formula. What's the in which the, the units of the radius? Oh, I, I think I'll come to it, but it's a good question. I think I, um, I'm not, uh, okay, I, I think I'll come to it, but if not, I'll, uh, it's a very good question. So all, the, all, all radius, when I say radius, I, I mean uh, radius relative to the distance between manifolds, which will, in under the assumption that I make, uh, it is the same as radius relative to the, to the center, the distance from them. Very good question. So, so this is dimensionless quantity R. Is the is what it's it's what's what's important is how big the manifolds are relative to the distance between them or to the distance from the common origin because otherwise of course you can just multiply everything by some number and nothing will change. Okay, thanks for the question. Okay, so let's go back to uh, uh, to to the notion of uh, <coughs> of uh, ma of man uh, where this uh, how, how do we define R M and D M and the notion is coming from uh, v very much in the spirit of of uh, support vector machines uh, and, uh, and, uh, and support vectors. Uh, so uh, imagine we, we are looking for a max margin uh, hyperplane that separates them. Actually, since we are near capacity, then every solution is max margin solution. The margin is small. Uh, but uh, we know that in that case, the weight vector uh, of uh, orthogonal to the hyperplane can be written in terms of a sum of uh, support vectors. So x mu are the sub are, are, are subset of the of the uh, of the input data. Y mu are their labels, and lambda mu are the support vector coefficients. Uh, 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 if they are support vectors, then it's bigger than bigger than zero. So that's that formula that that uh, holds also also for manifold separating manifold, uh, except that in principle uh, there can be infinite no large number of access there because there may be infinite large no large number of of of, of uh, points, uh, except for the case that you can take support vectors that uh, collection of support vectors from each manifold uh, and basically combine them together by convex sum. And, uh, and have only one support vector per manifold. So the statement is that you can write the weight vector that separates those manifolds as the linear sum of at most p vectors, where the vectors are the support vectors, but they represent the entire manifold. You, a manifold, OK? So then you have here, that's what we call anchor point. So now, now the summation here is going only at most over the p manifolds, and each one of them is contribute one one support vector, which, which we call anchor points. So, uh, so let's look at these anchor points uh, more in more detail. So, imagine this is the manifold, and imagine you have some labeling random separation between the other manifolds, and this may be the point here, may be the anchor points for this configuration. However, the anchor point of this manifold. Uh, will change if uh, the orientation of the other manifolds change, and maybe also the labeling of them. So in this configuration, this manifold is the same, but the environment changes, so now the anchor point will be here, and so on and so forth. So the point is that <coughs> if you look at the manifold and you vary uh, the, the realization of the environment of the manifolds, 
then you will vary the anchor point of the manifold. Okay? So by, uh, by varying uh, this procedure, in principle, by varying the uh, location and orientation and labeling of all the environment, you basically induce a distribution on points on the manifold uh, simply by, by the variation of the anchor points on that. Okay, so that's basically how we, uh, we turn into geometry because for a given, a given configuration, you just have one point per manifold. But uh, if the environment changes, you have then uh, different points and, and then uh, by this you, you basically get a distribution of the manifold. So the whole point of getting a geometry is that defining the measure. And what I'm claiming is that for this problem, the measure is uh, the uh, distribution of anchor points on a given manifold, on a fixed manifold, as the environment of it is changing. So you can see, you know, those of you that are familiar with mean field theories, it's the same idea as uh, any mean field. You, you look at a given spin or a given neuron, and you ask, uh, you know, what is the field on it as the environment uh, changes or something. So that's uh, kind of the same thing, that the geometry is induced by thinking about a given manifold as the statistics uh, with the same st as the realization of the environment changes. This will be in the spring glass, it will be the local field will be Gaussian or, or something like that. So here it is a Gaussian or, or induced uh, 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 distribution of anchor points. So I think that's kind of interesting from, from, from those of you who are theorists, the interesting concept of geometry. It's kind of uh, really in the spirit of mean field, the geometry on an object induced by varying those extreme points about vectors uh, on, uh, on, uh, of that manifold as the environment is changing. One of the picture views, your point is not on the ma in the manifold, is that? Okay, can you say it again? In one of these. The yeah, so the, 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 anchor po the anchor point in general yeah. is in the convex hull. Right. So, so this is, uh, yeah, this is exactly right. On the previous yes. slide, there were coefficients lambda which needed to be positive. Right. What's with the positivity there? What? Why are they positive? Why, what was the role of them? Why had, why do they well, if, it's, it's kind of a sparse representation. If you, you allow positive and negative, then you, know, you, you, you can have many, many vectors which cancel each other. Okay. So the whole point, it's like in support vector machine. It's kind of a sparse representation of the weight vector. And uh, by, by having only positive... Uh, uh, coefficient on that. Okay, so here's an example of that from uh, from the ImageNet uh, data. So image, so this is this is real real images. So this is a vase manifold, and and uh, uh, this is the typical vase kind of. Uh, uh, but but now if we look at separation of the vase from other manifolds, including uh, including a cabbage head. Uh, what you find is that, uh, no, forget about it. You find here, uh, this, yeah, so you find here um, the anchor point, which is somewhat in between, if you want a vase and a cabbage. If you take the same uh, vase, but you separate it from, from the birdhouse, uh, then you find that the anchor point on the vase is now look like uh, a vase with a, it is a vase with a, with a bird. Uh, painted on it. So you can see that the, the same manifold has different, uh, uh, different anchor point depending on uh, the orientation and the labeling of, of the other manifolds. Okay. So, um, okay, let me skip that. Uh, okay. So given that, uh, <coughs> given that definition, so S uh, here is the, uh, is the projection of the, of the anchor points uh, on the subspace of a manifold, uh, and you can show that's the kind of summary of the mean field. You can show that uh, the average over this uh, support vector coefficient lambda, which you asked, the average over lambda and the magnitude square of the support vector is the inverse capacity. Radius is simply the uh, the radius of those uh, uh, the, the the Euclidean distance of the so of the support uh, of the of the anchor points from the center. So this is delta s squared. And the dimension is how those vectors are, the anchor points are separated uh, along the different axes. So it is basically uh, delta S dotted with the, with the Gaussian field uh, and average. So uh, 
of course, the details are in the papers, but uh, I hope you can you get, you get some some insight to that. And actually, uh, once you know RM and DM, as I said before, uh, you can plug it into the bolt. But actually, you can even write a simpler expression that alpha c, and, and that's that's a good approximation in wide range of parameters. Alpha c is simply one over DM, and then depending on RM at, at the top here, R minus two. So the, the, the key thing is to, is to estimate DM and RM, and there are mean field procedures how to do it, and numerical algorithms, and so on and so forth. OK, what about random manifold, this, this uh, fake manifold? So I already told you that alpha c is 2 over m uh, in that case. But actually, one can also compute DM and RM. In this case, DM is linear with the number of points on the manifold, on each manifold. Uh, and RM is just fixed to be square root of p minus 1. So that's kind of interesting because it gives you bounds, uh, not only on capacity, but also on dimension and radius. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how, how you apply it. OK. Um, so the, the notion, I'm saying geometry, but the notion of geometry is subtle. And it, again, has to do with the, with the mean field nature of the geometry. So imagine I take a manifold. Uh, and this is the manifold, the original manifold, and just scale it by some factor. So I just the same shape, I just shrink it, are less than one, or make it bigger by uh, are bigger than one. So what do we expect? So if it was really geometry in the usual sense, I would expect that the dimension will not change, and dm will not change, and because I don't change anything about the shape and so on, and the radius rm will just scale with r linearly. That okay, but unfortunately, that's that's that that's true only in some re in some region. But in general, it's not the case. So there is some nonlinear interaction between dimension <coughs> and R, and and you can see why because the for for linear classification, uh, what what we are interested is as I said in the distance between the manifolds or in distance from the center, uh, and that affects the, the the geometry. So that's a nonlinear non effect that enter, uh, which kind of interesting. Uh, and indeed, uh, let me show an example of that. So, so here is uh, ellipsoid. So here is uh, a, a, a synthetic example where we take uh, n-dimensional, uh, n is large, um, thousand or more, and we uh, embed in them uh, ellipsoids. Uh, so here, here is an example where where d is, uh, to your question, where d is actually n. Okay. We just take ellipsoid. This is the, this is actually the SVD radii from ImageNet um, uh, ImageNet uh, pixels. Uh, so just you just do SVD on on the on the images, and you look at the. Uh, uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, you look at you look at the collection of images for a given category, and just do SVD, and you look at the radii, and you get something. Now suppose it was ellipsoid. Okay, so that will be something like that. Uh, that, that's, that's the ellipsoid. Uh, and now, <coughs> you, what we do now is scale them by this factor r. And you can see here what happens is that uh, when r is small, then the capacity is high, or the one, so they're kind of untangled. When little r is big, then uh, there's a crossover uh, to, uh, to essentially zero, zero capacity. And you can see what happens here. So dm. Uh, for, little, for small r, dm is very small. It's uh, uh, basically logarithmic in the dimension. Uh, and then there is a crossover when r is order 1 to uh, the full dimension. So as the manifolds become larger and larger, uh, dm explores more and more dimension. And then eventually, just the full dimension. Uh, this is why the capacity is 0. And if you look at the radius rm over the scale, so you see sm for small r, it's really flat, which you would expect from simple geometry, geometric notion that the radius over r will be, will be constant. But actually, when r is large, uh, it's sublinear, which means that the, 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 the anchor points uh, uh, are now penetrating inside uh, the manifold to some degree, and therefore it's sublinear increase. So uh, this ratio goes down. So, but but you can see here what I said about uh, the RM square DM uh, or the one. So this is the untangled region, and then crossover to the tangled region where the capacity is very small.
Okay. Um, okay, I don't think I have time for call. Okay. May I'll, I'll just talk. Okay, let me just mention correlation. So, I mean, I, I, I spoke about geometry, but in the theory, in the, in the, in the simple mean field theory, those manifolds are randomly located and randomly oriented. But if you look at neural data and you look at, uh, at uh, also data from, uh, from uh, artificial databases and artificial neural networks, you do find correlations in the manifold. So basically, uh, manifolds are clusters. So imagine clusters of manifolds are here, some clusters are there, and so on and so forth. And this clustering tends to reduce the ability to separate them. Because for, for a given separation, for a given labeling, you could imagine that makes it easier. If this is plus one and this are minus one, then the, the, the clustering actually helps. But since we are talking about random labeling, then overall the capacity is reduced. And the theory tells us exactly uh, by how much. And essentially what, what happens under, uh, in, 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 a, in a, again, a range of, of, of parameters, uh, the, the, the weight vector will just uh, would just be orthogonal to the common subspace of those manifolds. So kind of uh, uh, project out the, the low rank correlation structure and work in the, in the null uh, subspace. So basically, the, it will to decorrelate them. Uh, uh, and, and that's what, what we find also in practice. OK, so there is an interesting, this is one correlation, correlation in the manifold clustering of the manifold position. There's another very relevant uh, 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 correlation is correlation in the axis of variation. So imagine that manifolds are maybe positioned randomly, but the, orient but the orientation of the manifold uh, is kind of parallel. In that case, uh, of course, it uh, might be easier to, to separate them because the axis of variability is shared. So that's kind of <laughs> important for computation, important also for, 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 for neuroscience. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and it's, it's an important feature of correlations that uh, one has to take into account. So basically, there are manifold geometry, <coughs> number of manifold, there are geometry, and two types of correlations. Correlation between the, in the position of the manifold, clustering in the position, and correlation in the axis of variation. Both correlations uh, figure in, uh, in uh, the quality of representation in terms of, uh, in terms of separability of them. So let me, let me show you an example how we apply this to real data. <coughs> so this is the ImageNet, uh, as you all know, um, about a million images uh, organized in about 1,000 categories, so 1,000 uh, points per category, and there are a variety of uh, deep neural networks that uh, are trained to uh, uh, train to um, uh, to cl to um, uh, classify them or to to ad to uh, I to uh, identify the uh, their identity um, and so on and so forth. So uh, we are talking about uh, two types of uh, of manifolds. One manifold. Uh, are uh, point cloud manifolds. So imagine uh, each category, each uh, in, in ImageNet, has about 1,000 points. So uh, this will be one class, this will be another class. So, so in this case, manifold will just be uh, the number point cloud, the number of images. Uh, another manifold that you can do is take a sample of, of images. Temple, so you take an object, you have 1,000 images, you take one. <coughs> typical uh, typical image, uh, <coughs> and you apply a fine transformation to change the, the location, orientation, distortion, and so on. And now you can, because this uh, small number of parameters, you can easily uh, dense, uh, densely sample them and generate essentially a, con a smooth manifold. So we wanted to see whether our theory ap is applicable both to smooth manifold with an infinite number of points uh, in them and to a point cloud. So these are two different types of manifolds. And here is an example of how the point cloud looks like. So uh, what you see here is uh, the capacity. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is for AlexNet an example. So this is uh, the input layer uh, and this is the, the, the top layer, the feature layer. Uh, 
And this is what you see here, the capacity. Uh, uh, there is some error bars because of the sampling of, uh, of uh, manifolds and points and so on, but, uh, but, but they are small. Um, and, 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 if, and this is, uh, uh, this is the dimension, uh, again, focused on this and, and this and, and radius. So you see the capacity goes substantially high uh, as the signal propagates along the layers. And at the same time, the dimension goes down from about 80 to, to, to 20 uh, across the layers, and, and radius uh, goes down from about 1.4 and, and down. OK, so yes? How is this evaluated? Because this is not just applying the theory, because the data do not satisfy the assumptions you are making about the independence or the kind of correlation. This is the miracle. This, this is the test. This is why we do this. We have a theory, replica, whatever you want, and we have uh, and large n and large p and all this, and the assumptions, and we wanted to know whether it corresponds to real life. Okay. So, so how should I read? I mean, uh, how should I read this picture? I mean, how do I? How do you compute <coughs> the alpha c, for instance? Like the so the way we compute it is two things. First of all, we measure the the only okay, we 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 uh, the the the, prob the the main issues about the assumption that I made are the correlation between the centers of the manifold and correlation between the axis of variation. Axis of variation turns out to be very small; you can ignore that. We, we tested it. A correlation between the centers is substantial, and as I said, we we project them out. Which means that, the, that, that, the, that the, we found that the, the correlations have lowering structure. So there is some uh, directions <coughs> which are shared among the manifolds. And the weight vector is simply orthogonal to that. <coughs> that's the optimal solution for separation. And that's what we do here. So we take the manifolds. We find those low rank correlations. We project them out from the data. And we, s and, and we find a classifier that separates them. Oh, OK, you find a classifier. So you run some logistic regression? So, so we do two things. Yeah. Uh, well, no, 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 it's a linear separation, no logistic regression. SVM, okay. SVM. SVM uh, we have algorithms that uh, are efficient for manifolds, but it's basically SVM, but uh, with, with efficient uh, tricks to, to do it. Uh, and uh, we have the mean field theory, both. Okay, here you here you don't you don't see. I'll, I'll show you correspondence between them. Okay, but the, but they they lie on top of each other. Okay. okay, so the two things you can do you can do simulations. In simulations you don't project anything. You take the data and you find the classifier that separate them, and you compare it with a theory. I can show you. Uh, oh, here it is. This is the mean field theory by projecting out the common uh, correlated structures and then, uh, and then use the RM and DM to compute the capacity. And this is the simulation. And here are different manifolds and different layers and different networks. OK? OK, what I want to, to, point, to, point, uh, to point out, what are these two other things here? Uh, the, the uh, two, two, two things are interesting. We wanted to understand what is this value here at the pixel layer, and is it expected or not. So what you can do, <coughs> you can take the, the images and shuffle them across categories. That's what I meant, the fake manifolds, OK? So in that case, uh, basically, the capacity is 2 over m, as, uh, and as you see here, the dash line. And indeed, it is flat, OK? We, what we can also do is ask whether the ability, the improvement, the untangling of the, of, the, of the representation is due to the learning, because these are all trained networks. The only thing which we train is the classifier, the linear classifier. But the network itself is trained. Okay? So we can ask, what happens if we take random weight vectors, 
initial, they initialize ve vectors before training, but the same architecture. Does it do anything? Okay, and that's this one. So uh, there is some improvement, uh, but it's you know basically flat. So there is some contribution uh, from uh, from the architecture, but most of the gain is from actually having the filters uh, trained according to uh, to the backdrop of, of this task. Okay, um, so. What you see here is that, uh, but the point here is that the pixel layer is not very, very, very uh, substantially above what random points will be, ra shuffled points. So the conclusion is that at the pixel layer, the manifolds are so entangled that they are essentially or almost like random points. Okay, so the random points will be here, and and the actual true manifolds of the pixel layer will be here. Okay, so this is this is uh, I think a very nice demonstration of what is going on in the network, starting from almost random points, uh, which are completely entangled. So they think about all the points of dogs and cats and so on as completely mixed. So this will be this capacity. The pixel layer is doing a little bit better than that, but not by much to uh, to the final layer. And and similarly for uh, it, so if you look here, uh, for instance, for radius and dimension, this is will be for sh shuffled, uh, <coughs> for, for completely random, like here. So there is, a, 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 there is some substantial reduction of the manifold at the input layer, at the pixel layer, but still it is way above <coughs> what, uh, what is going uh, uh, below uh, at the top layer. So it's an interesting, uh, for theorists, I'll show you a, a, a graph which uh, we are still struggling with understanding it, but I think is interesting. And this is the following. Suppose we take the capacity uh, and sh of, the, of, the, of the image net manifold and subsample them. Instead of taking 1,000 points, we take only 10 points per manifold. Okay? So this is this uh, 1 over m. Okay? So this is large. This is 1,000. Uh, this is like this is like the full manifold. This is the only 10 of them or whatever. Okay, and you see the capacity is almost like 2 over m. X is 1 over m. So the capacity is 2 over m, but the, coefi the, 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 the coefficient is slightly bigger than than 2, and there is an offset. Okay, so that means that if you take m goes to infinity, so uh, we claim that we have the asymptotic limit of ImageNet statistics. We can take m goes to infinity and predict what will be the capacity uh, <coughs> at the pixel layer here. And similarly, we can do it for the for the top layer, except that it looks like it uh, decreases like one of square root of m, much slower. And of course, the baseline here is much bigger. So there is kind of interesting uh, power law relations uh, and differences. <laughs> and we are now testing it uh, actually uh, numerically by having more data than the image net uh, and then see whether our asymptote actually agrees. So th that's what we are doing now. Uh, <coughs> so it may be that uh, there is some notion of image net statistics beyond those 1,000 points. That's what I'm, that I'm trying to see. There is some large M limit. It doesn't mean that this is what, what, uh, what every, uh, I mean, real life may be more than that, but that, that is a well-defined statistics uh, limit in large M. Anyway, so uh, how, how am I doing with time? Minus three. What? Minus three, I think. Minus three, OK. <laughs> so OK, so let me, let me run. Uh, OK. Okay, so uh, okay, so I, um, okay, so let me let me just jump to the end, and the end is something else. Uh, so let me just a few minutes about uh, about a story which is related to manifold, related to geometry, but related to another aspect, which is not about ability to separate manifold to untangle them directly, but <coughs> about to generalize from a few examples. So the idea is uh, it, it's known as a few shot uh, uh, learning problem. The idea is the following. Suppose I'm showing a, a human or an animal or a machine uh, new uh, ex examples, a few examples from new, new categories, new objects, new tools that they never saw before. 
And the question is, will they be able to generalize correctly? If I'm showing now another example, okay, will they correctly uh, generalize from a few examples? So I'm showing you a few examples of some weird, I don't know, airplane or something. And uh, then I'm telling you, this is, this is the examples. Now I'm giving another example. Is this the new object or this category or not? That's, that's well known as few-shot learning. It's a big problem uh, whether uh, to, to a challenge to, uh, to get it. So the question is, uh, what, uh, what uh, is required for, having, uh, for being able to do uh, a few-shot learning? So these are examples well known in literature. So here is the way we formalize it in, in our manifold things. So imagine we have an underlying two manifold, two manifolds, and I'm show, I'm giving only two examples, one per manifold, per the new manifold. So I'm giving you one example, another example. I'm telling you these are two different categories, and then I'm ask, I'm asked what will be the the probability that you will make the correct guess about a new point, that it belongs to this versus this. And the strategy is very simple. What, what am I going to do? If I'm giving these two points, I'm going to draw the, mm, the optimal hyperplane, the max margin hyperplane. And then the question is whether this hyperplane will correctly separate them. OK, so here is the point. So, you know, if, if my hyperplane is uh, here, then it's fine. If my hyperplane tends to be here, then it's bad because it intersects those manifolds. So it's a very qu simple question. Given two points or, or three points per, per, new, per, per manifolds, separate them by uh, the, optimal, uh, the optimal plane. And then the question is whether this will generalize correctly. And that's the way you formalize it. And, uh, and amazingly, we find a very simple formula, at least for ellipsoids, uh, for, for, for the ability to generalize uh, from one point per manifold. <coughs> okay? And there is, a, 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 and there is a, 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 an effective radius, which is given here, which is not, comp not related to, uh, uh, directly to anchor points, uh, given by this formula. And there is a threshold you see here when r, effective r, is less than 1, you generalize perfectly. So there is a very well-defined geometry, geometric measure that says that from two points alone, you can perfectly generalize across the, the entire uh, uh, ellipsoid if this effective radius is less than 1. <coughs> OK. What's kind of counterintuitive, but uh, for, for, for you it will not be counterintuitive, that the larger the dimensionality of these underlying manifolds, the better chances you have to make correct generalization. Okay? So you can see here, this is the future generalization error as a function of the radius. Okay, so R is the threshold. The higher the dimensionality, the lower the, the error. And it's, I, I'll leave it to you for dinner to, to figure out why, but it's, it's very simple intuition. But it's, it goes the other way around from, from, the, from the classification. So this is a nice example how, ge how the effect of geometry uh, it can be very different depending on what is the task. So here, the higher the dimensionality, the better the few-shot learning. Finally, there is also a very nice scaling relation between 2M-shot learning. Not 2, but let's say I have 4 or 6 or whatever points per manifold. And I generalize, so it basically scales the effective radius by m to the 1 fourth. Okay? So all of this collapsed to one, one scaling law. So obviously, the larger the m is, the effective radius shrink, and therefore, the, the better the generalization is. And uh, finally, we tested it on, uh, again, ImageNet. Uh, and, uh, so and this kind of example where we, what we did here, we, we, we take a manifold, one, we, we show uh, a manifold and, uh, and another manifold, so a pair of manifold. So we show uh, this manifold, bullet train, for instance, and, another, and one example from this and another example from any other, from a collection of, not any other, collection of other pairs. Uh, 
<coughs> and measure generalization error. And you know the dashed line is the is the theoretical curve, and 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 this is the data. This, of course, the the best examples, but uh, but anyway, uh, we, we, this is still work in progress. The dashed so line is computed with ellipsoids. What? The dashed line is computed. The dashed line is computed with ellipsoid. Is this this expression exactly? And exactly, fantastic. That's. Yeah, exactly. The point which I want to make is the following. Um, and and there, are, there are tweaks and caveats on this which we are working on. But by the way, these are, OK, let me just, OK, this is a question. Uh, let me just say one, one word. And, this, and again, you know, the, the scaling with, one, with M shot, it works very nicely. Uh, but I cheated here because I took pairs of manifold from the trained ones. So how it's different from you take from untrained ones. And, and basically, this is the summary. So if you look at the, <coughs> the histogram of generalization error of pairs of manifold from few shot learning, from the trained one, this is what you get. That's what I showed you. I showed you the average. This is the, you know, I showed you as a function of R. This is just the histogram. Uh, and this is for the held out for new ones. And this is for completely uh, untrained network. So untrained network is very bad, as we expect. Uh, not chance, but uh, close, you know. Uh, the trained one, the, the held out is much better than, than random, but still is, uh, is different from trained. So I think the challenge of, uh, of one, one of the challenge of uh, deep learning is to close this gap. Because uh, we, we really want to have uh, a network that uh, has generated a sufficiently good generic object representation. So it doesn't matter, it should not matter whether those objects have been trained or object that has not been trained. So I think that means that there is some mileage to go in deep learning if we really want to uh, use them or think about them as, as uh, models of a good generic representation of object, as we would like to think about them, is to close this gap, to have a very good uh, uh, sh few shot learning <coughs> which is, doesn't discriminate between trained. So there is some overfitting which, uh, uh, with this aspect which is, sh which is shown here. Uh, but the point I want just to, in closing, the point which I want to say about, <coughs> about your question about, man, about ellipsoid, we still, uh, this ongoing work with Ben Schorcher from, from Stanford, we still are, uh, uh, are uh, trying to understand better why it works and under what conditions. Uh, but my point is that in general, as I said, as I said at the beginning, that whether you can take a point cloud like ImageJet and, think, and, and approximate them as ellipsoid or not depends on what you want to do with it. What are the computations? For high capacity separation, that's a, that would be very bad, uh, very bad approximation. But apparently, for pairwise uh, few shot generalization, which is another important uh, function uh, of object representation, this may not be so bad. And, and I'll, I'll close by that. Thank you. Thank you.